This is EHJ Today at the Cardiology Update in Davos, Switzerland, and I'm Tom Luscher, I'm Editor-in-Chief of the European Heart Journal, and I'm talking to Fabian Nietlisbach, who works in our department and is the head of uh, the Structural Intervention Group. Welcome. Thank you very much. So we just said that it's 15 years ago when Alain Cribier did the first procedure. It was quite complicated at uh, that point in time, wasn't it? It was. It was uh, done in a patient in cardiogenic shock. Uh, initially, those procedures were done anti-grade, meaning going transvenous, transeptal, and were quite uh, cumbersome. Um, but it paved the way for the evolution that we're facing at the moment. And so what was the next step then? Was it the John Webb's approach, was it? So I think the big thing is uh, to get those uh, results um, done in kind of a a manner that it's reproductive and this was first achieved by John Webb using the retrograde approach uh, from transarterial basically how we're doing it uh, nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, however the patient population he had to choose at that time was again very very sick patients. Only those who the surgeons didn't want. That, that's absolutely correct and uh, of course there was also an evolution with the devices per se. So in the initial series that uh, John Webb published in 2006 it was uh, not possible to cross the valve in a fair amount of patients, something that nowadays is really uh, not an issue cake, anymore. Huh? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, good. And so well, initially these were like 85-year-old patients with a really high surgical risk. What were the results then initially? So the initial results uh, were still quite, quite good. Patients who survived the procedure did fairly well thereafter. However, mortality uh, rate was in the two digit, in the low two digit numbers. Like 12, 12 14 percent? Yeah, around 15 percent. Mm -hmm. And uh, then with the first uh, evolution of the device that was then studied in the partner uh, B trial, mm -hmm. uh, looking, at, looking at inoperable patients, uh, this, uh, the results are still at, still at this time quite good. They had a mortality rate. Uh, with the procedure, uh, like 30-day mortality rate, that was around 5%. Uh, in the uh, partner A trial, I think it was 4% mortality rate. Stroke yeah, rate you progress, seemed to be yeah. a, a, an issue at that time. But over time, this, the results have really become better and better. Besides mortality, one issue was stroke, wasn't it? Uh, it intuitively, I always thought when I heard about it that if you were to to crash the valve that you would have a stroke in every other patient, but this was not really the case, surprisingly enough. Eh? Indeed, with the, uh, with the partner uh, A trial, there was uh, some, some thoughts whether the stroke rate would be higher with Tavias, with uh, surgical aortic valve replacement. However, also clamping a, a calcified aorta probably buries a certain risk of, yeah, yeah. Uh, of stroke. Studies look at when do these hits uh, occur, so when, when is the embolic burden most during the procedure, and it is indeed during crossing of the valve and uh, during valve deployment. Sure. Uh, so there is a certain risk associated with it, however, nowadays it really doesn't translate into into strokes. In the uh, most when recent uh, data from the uh, partner uh, uh, Sapien 3 trial, the stroke rate at 30 day was 1 point, uh, or 0 0.7 percent for major strokes and 1.1 percent for strokes overall, which is incredibly and, uh, low and statistically yes. lower than with surgical So there is some embolization, but it doesn't translate into clinically apparent strokes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So initially there was also this approach of transapical implantation, but uh, this has declined in importance, hasn't it? It has. It has basically because the data were really uh, not good. Yes. So it could be shown in, uh, in the uh, partner trial as well, uh, in, the, in, this, in the following trial from the partner uh, A trial, that the results were even worse than with surgical or valve replacement. Uh, and with the evolution of the device, basically also nowadays in our hospital, about 99% of yes. patients can be treated transfemorally uh, or uh, another transarterial route, and this should be uh, done like it is, uh, in my opinion. So now we go to intermediate risk. What patient group would that be that we can now consider? 
So it's interesting to look at the evolution of the randomized trials. So the, uh, the partner B, then partner A, and then there was the uh, core valve trial out, which was looking at lower risk patients than uh, partner uh, A. The SDS score in the core valve trial was around 7%. And for the first time, we see a mortality benefit of, of TAVI over surgery. Yeah. So this was uh, quite impressive. And uh, we have now data uh, from uh, Vinod Thurani, from uh, the partner group as well, who was looking at the propensity matched analysis from patients undergoing uh, SAVR and TAVR. Uh, those were um, intermediate risk patients as well. And again, it shows a, a, a significant benefit of TAVI over surgical aortic valve replacement. So I think to the lower risk groups we move, the better the outcomes uh, of TAVI as well, of course, as with the evolution of the, of the device. But um, um, I just looked up a study that uh, a meta-analysis was looking at four trials mm -hmm. investigating low-risk patients, so an SDS score below four. This article is impressed, but there again it shows a, a borderline significant benefit of TAVI. So I think data are indicating that TAVI is at least not worse than, right. surgi than surgery for aortic and valve so replacement. And so if patients hear about it, they would certainly opt for TAVR, I guess, or TAVI. Now, what's the future, do you think? Is it, uh, will, will we treat 55-year-olds, 60-year-olds with TAVI? Well, I think there, there comes the question of durability and um, the question of uh, wanting to revalve uh, degenerated valves several times. These are concepts that sound tempting to me, but may not sound tempting to, uh, to another uh, potential patient. So I think this needs to be discussed with, uh, on a patient basis. But uh, I, had a, uh, I was treating a patient recently, uh, a young patient uh, who is very, very active. He's uh, doing lots of sports. He's working uh, late night. And uh, so he definitely didn't want oral anticoagulation. And he opted knowing that he will probably down the road need one or two more valve replacements. He opted for, uh, for a biological valve, a surgical valve, but still a biological valve. Yeah, more and more the patients also are involved in decision making. And I think that's fair enough as long as they know what the risk is of a biological valve uh, in, in the future. But I think the Tavi story 15 years down the road is really exciting and we look forward to the next results. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you very much.